If it's Thursday, trouble ahead for Trump challengers. New polling shows the former president up big over his primary rival Nikki Haley in South Carolina as President Biden hits the trail with an eye on November, courting union voters in battleground Michigan. Plus, abortion access and the deciders in 2024. Our new election year series asks women voters in battleground Pennsylvania about the impact of the Dobbs decision and what it means for their decision this November. And a major apology. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin opens up about his health, admitting he should have told the public and the president about his cancer diagnosis and his emergency hospitalization. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington. With new developments in the Republican presidential primary and the Democratic strategy to try to hang on to the White House in November. On the Republican side, a new poll out of Nikki Haley's home state of South Carolina showing Donald Trump beating her by 26 points. After losing the first two contests, Haley said on Meet the Press she has to do better in South Carolina than she did in New Hampshire. And this poll shows she has work to do. With her candidacy on the line, Haley's campaign hit the airwaves in the Palmetto State today, trying to convince voters that their former governor should be their future nominee. When we get to South Carolina, Donald Trump's going to have a harder time falsely attacking me. The great people of South Carolina know I cut their taxes. They know I signed the toughest illegal immigration bill in the country. Meanwhile, President Biden hit the trail today to meet with a key Democratic voting bloc, union workers in a key battleground state, Michigan. That trip comes after a recent set of polls from Bloomberg News and Morning Consult showed President Biden trailing former President Trump in Michigan and virtually every other battleground state, though some are within the margin of error. In a sign of the political peril facing the president in Michigan and beyond, his visit was preceded by demonstrations calling for a ceasefire in Gaza led by a group called Abandoned Biden. In this area, eight out of 10 Arab and Muslim voters voted for Joe Biden. Obviously, Joe Biden does not represent those people anymore. Now, there's another warning sign for Democrats today from our new series, The Deciders Focus Groups. We are collaborating with Engages, Syracuse University and Sago to highlight and hear from key slices of the 2024 electorate. Our first conversations featured 15 Pennsylvania women who voted for Trump in 2020, but who opposed the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Democrats are hoping these types of voters could swing close elections, but if last night was any indication, they are still overwhelmingly standing by Trump. Take a listen to some of what they said. By the show of fingers, who would say former President Trump is at least partially responsible for Roe v. Wade being overturned by the Supreme Court? Hmm. So none of you would say that he's at least partially responsible for it. Maybe just a little bit. I think people should have their own right to choose what they want to do with their bodies. But I mean, it's not a number one factor on who I'm going to vote for either way. It's not that important. I hate to say it, but it's overall, it's probably not going to determine who I vote for. It's uh, not of my top three reasons to vote for somebody. It means nothing in the grand scheme of everything to me. I'm going to vote who for who I think is going to do the best for my family. Okay, and abortion is not part of that consideration. At this point, no. Who would take Trump? So I've got basically everybody except Michelle. For a moment, let's imagine that the election is tomorrow. By a show of fingers, how many of you would take Trump? Six of the seven. Just fascinating. But there is a potential warning sign for former President Trump. There were 2020 supporters of his in that panel who said they
they can't support him anymore. We're going to delve into all of this. NBC's Ali Vitali is following the Haley campaign in South Carolina. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is with Trump in Las Vegas. NBC's Monica Alba is with President Biden in Detroit. And NBC's Amy Schalsendor is here with me on set with more on those focus groups. Ali, I have to start with you and Nikki Haley. She got some tough new poll numbers out today after telling me last weekend that she has to do better in South Carolina than she did in New Hampshire. It shows she has her work cut out for her. Yeah, that's definitely the case here, Kristen, because over the last few weeks, as I and you have asked Haley what the metric for success is here in South Carolina, she simply keeps it vague, instead saying she's got to do better here than she did in New Hampshire, and her metric for success in New Hampshire was doing better there than she did in Iowa. So they want to show a consistent upward trajectory, but again, they are doing so against the backdrop of tough poll numbers. Yes, there's those that just came out today, but of course, we have seen Trump with a sizable lead in this state over the course of the last last several months of this primary. The only thing that makes South Carolina, I think, feel a little different is the fact that Haley herself would call this her sweet state of South Carolina because it is her home state. She's won here statewide twice in both of her gubernatorial elections. She says that's something that's going to help her here in this upcoming primary. But the other thing that's going to help her, I think, is the way that she's going at the former president, her only and chief rival at this point talking about his age, talking about his mental fitness. But I find it fascinating to see the ways that she's engaging on his legal troubles, engaging with them in theory, if not in substance. Listen to her earlier today. And now it comes out, our campaign reports have come out, and he's used $50 million of his campaign funds on legal fees. His court cases have just started. There are two more in March, and it goes out for the rest of the year. Do you really think he's going to win against Joe Biden when he's spending all of that money on legal fees? He's not. So Haley there, Kristen, mixing her regular electability argument where she looks toward the general and cites polls that show her doing better than Trump against President Biden, but then also making this argument that we've heard now several times on the campaign trail that Trump has a split focus. If he's focused on his court cases and his ongoing legal jeopardy, he's not able to focus on the issues facing the country, something Haley says she's capable of doing. We have definitely seen her rhetoric ramp up in these recent weeks. There's no doubt about yeah. that, Allie. Let me ask you about another finding in this poll, because if you delve into these numbers, one of the biggest problems for Nikki Haley is her favorability numbers, which went down since this became a two-person race. What is the campaign saying about this? Is this just the product of running one-on-one -on -one against Trump? I think that is exactly the explanation, Kristen. We've seen this in other polls across early states, the way that Haley's favorability has suffered when Trump has put her in his crosshairs and landed multiple attacks on her. We saw the same thing go on with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Anyone who is the person against Trump, and in this case, the binary that Haley has always wanted is just that, they innately will have their favorability ratings impacted. That being said, for Haley, the coalition that she's trying to build in South Carolina in theory, it tracks with what we saw in a place like New Hampshire, trying to pull in maybe reluctant Republicans, but certainly independents, maybe here even some Democrats. But the demographics of this state are so different. New Hampshire was fertile ground for a coalition like that. South Carolina, much steeper hill to climb, even for someone like Haley, who it's her home state. That's right. It's much more like in Iowa, where you have a large swath of evangelical voters. Absolutely. Part of what is making this such an uphill battle for Nikki Haley. Fantastic reporting, as always. Ali Vitali, thank you. Great to see you. Our Vaughn Hilliard is out in Las Vegas following the Trump campaign. He has the very latest. Hey, Kristen, look, Donald Trump hasn't held a single campaign event in South Carolina since his Iowa and New Hampshire wins. And this new poll from Washington Post and Monmouth indicates why. In South Carolina, that poll shows him with a 26-point lead over Nikki Haley, 58% to 32% for Haley. And he, the folks that said Donald Trump, they are a more enthusiastic group of supporters than those who said that they intend to go vote for Nikki Haley in her home state. And so these are just troubling signs for Haley's candidacy at a time in which the Republican National Committee is very much trying to focus its attention 
on Joe Biden in the general election. I am here in Las Vegas where the RNC is holding its annual winter meeting. And I've had conversations with numerous RNC committee men and women. These are key party activists from states around the country. And they have very much indicated to me that they are very focused on having Donald Trump be the nominee and beginning to uh, set up the joint fundraising operation that would formalize the fundraising uh, uh, team between the Trump campaign and the RNC. And FEC filings overnight, these new financial uh, records show that in the last six months of last year, uh, Joe Biden's campaign, re-election campaign, out fundraised Donald Trump's campaign, but also the super PAC aligned with Donald Trump. Almost two thirds of its mon uh, of its money was sent to another organization that has been helping Donald Trump with legal fees, which uh, is a heightening concern because Donald Trump's uh, legal uh, quagmire is still very much uh, relevant to today and the months ahead as he still awaits four criminal trials. In last year alone, more than $50 million going to legal fees and consultation. And so for Donald Trump, while well, he sees sturdy primary polling, uh, for him, uh, very much the concern turns toward the general election and the party apparatus' ability to effectively fundraise, all while knowing uh, Trump still is using uh, the affiliated super PACs as he uh, uh, legal piggy banks. And so for him, uh, this is a, a really an important spring here while Nikki Haley still is trying to beat him in the primary, uh, not only in South Carolina at the end of the month, but uh, uh, on Super Tuesday as well on March 5th. Kristen. All right, Von Hilliard, thank you for that. Monica, let me turn to you now. There are obviously some protests we we're talking about surrounding President Biden's visit to Michigan. This follows a series of protests that you guys were tracking last week when he was out on the trail. So break down what are his goals of this trip? How are they responding to the protesters? Exactly, Kristen. And the president is currently here in the Detroit area meeting with United Auto Workers, union workers specifically, and really trying to build on that momentum from the endorsement. But right outside of where that meeting is taking place, we are seeing dozens of protesters who have gathered there in Warren, Michigan, to really make their position very clear. And many of them, according to our team who's been speaking to them, supported the president back in 2020. These are people who they say would have voted for him again. But because of the Biden administration's continued support of Israel in its war against Hamas, they are saying that right now they cannot vote for Joe Biden. And they are leading this movement that is called the Abandoned Biden Movement to continually point out that they want to call for a complete ceasefire there because of the high number of civilian casualties of Palestinians. And they are really doing this now in a way that you're seeing more often on the trail when the president is traveling. And it's not just here in Michigan, but elsewhere. But the reason that the president is coming to this critical battleground state is to make this larger economic argument that is bolstered by this key union support. So you really see the president here trying to navigate the complexities of wanting to build on that domestically while really dealing with the foreign policy implications of his own decisions with voters that he will need if he wants to win a state like this or a state like Wisconsin. So you're really seeing both of these things and these competing interests on display here today, Kristen. We are, and as you've been talking and giving us your great reporting, Monica, we've been watching live pictures of those protesters, some even holding signs that say, quote, genocide Joe, which underscores, Monica, I think the breadth of this political problem for President Biden. I've spoken to some of these supporters who say, look, uh, one time supporters, I should say, uh, who say they cannot see themselves going back to President Biden. But what is the strategy to try to win some of these folks back, Monica? What's the campaign telling you about that? And this was really clear last week when the Biden campaign manager, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, came to Dearborn, Michigan. She was supposed to sit down with some key leaders in the Arab American community. There were some who said, look, we don't really want to sit down with you and have this conversation. There were others who did. So they were trying to make those connections and have these conversations. The White House has said that in the coming days and weeks, you're going to be seeing some White House officials, others connected to the campaign and the reelection 
effort come back to Michigan to try to have these discussions, but it's clearly quite fraught because the president himself, who is here, we know, for this union-driven event, is not sitting down with members of this community that we know of. That's not what is planned or in the schedule today. But so far, since the war began on October 7th, the White House and the campaign say there have been nearly 100 conversations between key officials in the Biden orbit and these key community members, and they want to continue that cadence. But clearly, there are calls for the president to reach out in a different way, perhaps, as well. Kristen. Yeah, that type of outreach could be key. There's no doubt about that. Monica Alba, thank you for your great reporting. Great to see you, as always. Let's turn now to Yamish Alcindor. Yamish, um, great to have you here. Let's go back to those voters who we heard from in the panel at the top of the show. Just extraordinary to hear from them, to hear them say that they are opposed to Roe v. Wade having been overturned, but they don't blame Trump for that, despite the fact that he appointed the three Supreme Court justices who made that possible, and that for the most part, they're planning to support him. What does all of this tell us, and what are the other big takeaways? Well, this was really a fascinating, fascinating focus group to watch. And the big headline is that they do not blame former President Trump for overturning Roe v. Wade, a decision that they do not agree with, even though he, of course, was the one who appointed the three justices who made it possible for Roe v. Wade to be overturned, even though former President Trump is on the campaign trail saying he's proud of the role he took. They're just saying, you know, there are other things the Democrats could have some did something differently. Former late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg could have retired, they said. So there were all these other reasons other than blaming former President Trump. The other big takeaway here is that abortion is just not a top issue for these mm. women. Now, we should say this is a slice of the electorate, right? These are women who voted for Donald Trump, who opposed Roe in Pennsylvania. That's the group. But they said that they see border security and the economy as their top issues, even, as they said, Kristen, that abortion is a top women's issue. It's just not their personal issue. And also, they support a national ban on abortion up to 50 15 weeks. Mm. So even though they agree um, that the Dobbs decision was wrong in their minds, they do not agree with the idea that a national abortion ban would be a problem, which is a key problem for Democrats who yeah. have been really trying to motivate voters to support them, making the case that, oh, if, there's, if, if, if there are more Republicans elected, there's going to be this national abortion ban. These women said as long as it's up to 15 weeks, meaning that if it was 12 weeks or six weeks, they wouldn't support that. But up to 15 weeks, they're okay with a national abortion ban, Kristen. It's just fascinating because it challenges what we have learned in these past elections, which is that abortion has been motivating in the midterms, in special elections, that it has typically benefited Democrats. What does this focus group say writ large about the strength of Trump's support? What it says is that Donald Trump's support is pretty steady. Um, these women, even as they oppose Roe, are super fans of the former president. Let's take a listen to what they said. Lisa, what's your reaction when Trump says that he's proud that he overturned Roe v. Wade? I don't like I don't like that comment. Um, I think it's terrible. I like Trump, but then I do disagree with that part of his beliefs. But on the same sense, I get his religious beliefs and I get a lot of the religious. I understand a lot of people's religious beliefs on that situation. So. I'm so like torn in the middle where me personally, I don't believe it. And I can't believe he says it like that. But on the other hand, I could see how and why he would be proud of that. Okay. Angie, what about you? Kind of gross. Gross that he said it. Yeah. Why? Um, I can believe that he said it, um, but it's just gross. To, to think it that that somebody can even be that disrespectful but um yeah that's all so a reminder that even though they don't like that Donald Trump is out on the campaign trail saying that he's proud of overturning Roe, they still will vote for him. So even those strong comments that you heard, they really twist themselves into pretzels, mm. making the case that they would support former President Trump. They said at one point, well, you know, he's the generational guy. He's older. That's why he talks about women in a way that I'm not comfortable with. He's trying to rile up crowds. That's why he's saying he's proud. He doesn't really mean it. 
they also physically sort of were dis showing their disdain for the former, for the current president, President Biden, mm. which just shows you that even though they don't like the things that Trump is saying, there's no way that these group of women would vote for President Biden. And that's a big problem for Democrats. It is a big problem indeed. And it's just so enlightening. Yamish, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great to see you here in person. Coming up, more key takeaways from our focus group with voters in Pennsylvania and what it says about the road to the White House. Plus, the Pentagon preparing for retaliation. We'll have the very latest on the anticipated U.S. response to the deadly drone strike that killed three U.S. service members. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. They have a lot of capability. I have a lot more. Welcome back. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin answered questions for the first time today since returning to the Pentagon following his prostate cancer diagnosis and subsequent stay at the ICU after suffering complications. The defense secretary called the diagnosis a gut punch that he wanted to keep private and took full responsibility for how the situation unfolded. Listen. I want to be crystal clear. We did not handle this right and I did not handle this right. I should have told the president about my cancer diagnosis. I should have also told my team and the American public. And I take full responsibility. I apologize to my teammates and to the American people. Now, it comes as the U.S. prepares what Secretary Austin described as a multi-tiered response to the deadly drone attack in Jordan earlier this week that killed three U.S. soldiers and injured dozens of other service members. Here's how the secretary described the current situation in the region. This is a dangerous moment in the Middle East. We will continue to work to avoid a wider conflict in the region. But we will take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our interests, and our people. And we will respond when we choose, where we choose, and how we choose. Joining me now is Peter Alexander, who is in that press conference. And I'm also joined by retired Admiral James Stavridis, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander and NBC News Chief International Analyst. Peter, let me start with you. Obviously, there was a lot of speculation about what might happen in the wake of Secretary Austin not being forthcoming with his cancer diagnosis. Today, we heard him say he has the full confidence of the president. He fielded a lot of questions about this, though. Peter, what were your key takeaways? Well, that's right. And as you just played, there really was a frank and forthcoming apology from the defense secretary, Lloyd Austin. Here he said his first instinct uh, after receiving the prostate cancer diagnosis was to keep it private. In effect, he said he didn't want to bother the commander in chief with that, given the president has so much other information on his plate. But he did acknowledge that this was a mistake. And, and he said it's one that he wanted to make clear that he got right moving forward. He also viewed it as a missed opportunity to speak out publicly with sort of a, a public health um, statement, effectively saying, particularly to black men in America, that as he described it, prostate cancer has a glass jaw. He said that those men should get stream, uh, screened. But to be clear, I think that the biggest significant statement he made, Kristen, was that he regrets the way this was handled and in effect that he ordered nobody to withhold it from the White House and from the commander in chief. He took mm. responsibility himself. He did, Peter, and it was really stunning to hear from him directly about this. You were among those pressing the defense secretary about the response to the three U.S. service members who were killed. Talk about what you learned. What did the secretary say about the retaliatory strikes? What were your big takeaways there? Well, multiple officials that we've been speaking to says, uh, say that the U.S. is now preparing for, for what will be a multi-target, um, potentially multi-week uh, campaign to take out Iranian-backed proxies, militia groups throughout that region. Here is how the secretary himself described the U.S. effort ahead. It's time to, uh, to take away even more capability than we've taken in the past. And in terms of the, the t you use the term escalation. We've not described what our, what our response is going to be, uh, but we look to hold the people uh, that are responsible for this accountable. He said that those Iranian proxies have capabilities, but in his words, I have a lot more. Mm. Kristen. 
Peter, before I let you go very quickly on another topic, the White House announcing action targeting violent settlers in the West Bank, a new executive order. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is the most significant move so far by President Biden and his administration, specifically as it relates to Israeli settlers there in the West Bank, a United Nations uh, group has provided details suggesting that there have been about 500 separate attacks since October 7th, including the death of at least uh, eight Palestinians at the hands of Israeli settlers, including one child, by the way. So what this will do, this new executive order, in effect, will uh, levy financial sanctions and even some visa bans on some specific individuals in the West Bank. Kristen. Peter, covering all of the angles for us from the White House after being in that news conference. We'll let you go so you can work on nightly news, and we will catch you then. Peter, thank you so much. Admiral Stavridis, let me turn to you, and let's talk about these retaliatory strikes. As you just heard Peter say, there could be a multi-pronged response. It could last for several weeks. Um, What are you anticipating, and what do you make of the timing, the fact that they seem to be giving time uh, for for Iranian-backed militias, some of them to leave countries like Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Uh, Before I go there, I just want to commend Lloyd Austin for standing up, taking responsibility, apologizing. Boy, we need a lot more of that when people make mistakes. I have a Mm. lot of respect for Lloyd. Um, In terms of the retaliatory strikes, I think we're doing this the right way, which is that the administration has tried for a couple of months to dissuade the Iranians from pushing the proxies to conduct these attacks both at sea and ashore. Um, That has not been sufficient. So now you ratchet it up, you escalate. I think the big difference this time, Kristen, is gonna be in two ways. One, it will go on longer. Mm. And number two, I think these strikes will go not just against Iranian proxies, but against the Iranian Revolutionary Guard who are for deployed outside of Iran, but are actively supporting these militias. Um, I think that will help send a stronger signal to the Iranians. Final thought, if that doesn't work, the administration is gonna have to consider strikes inside Iran. We don't wanna end up there. Let's hope the mullahs will be listening to this next round. I'm I'm so glad you bring that up because I want to get your response to what we're hearing from Iran. Iran is warning, quote, no U.S. threat to Iran will go unanswered. How should the United States take that warning? And to your point, there is a scenario where the U.S. could potentially have to strike inside Iran. Wouldn't that lead to a wider war, Admiral? It would, and we want to avoid that. On the other hand, um, simply saying, oh, Now we're frightened that Iran has said, uh, don't attack us, let's not do anything, is not a good option either. So we're going to play the ball down the middle here, come in very high, hard, but continue to strike outside of Iran. If we have to go into Iran, that's a whole different conversation, a lot of different options at play there. You probably would go after Iranian ships, their maritime capability, they're at sea platforms. And by the way, Chris, and you can also add cyber attacks mm. to this mix, which would have impact inside Iran as well as outside. Again, I think the administration is, is making the smart move at this point. Um, let's hold that card of attacking Iran directly back, at least thus far. Let me follow up with you on this idea of cyber attacks. Do you think that that is one of the options the administration is considering? And and is there a concern that Iran will retaliate regardless of what the U.S. does, what the next steps look like? Yeah, 100% certain that in the package of options the president is receiving, there are offensive cyber attacks both outside Iran, going after the militia groups and their infrastructure, but I suspect also potentially using... Uh, cyber means inside of uh, Iran itself. In terms of should we be afraid of the Iranians responding, I would be concerned about it, but not as concerned as I would be if we were going offensive with cyber in China or Russia. Mm. They have a lot more capability to retaliate. 
I think we could overmatch the Iranians in cyber quite easily. And Admiral, just before I let you go, let me ask you about one more thing that Secretary Austin said. He basically was asked about whether this would lead to withdrawing U.S. troops from the region. He said no, that that is not under consideration right now. Is that the right move? And is there something that could target the U.S. to potentially start removing troops? Uh, it is the right move for us not to withdraw troops, particularly in the face of Iranian aggression. And let's keep this in perspective. We have 2,500 troops in Iraq, maybe 500 in Syria. That's 3,000 troops. Um, at one point, as you well know, when I was Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, I had 150,000 troops under my command in Afghanistan. We had 170,000 troops in Iraq. This is a minimal presence mm. doing good work, counterterrorism, working with the Iraqis against the Islamic State. The last thing in the world we should do is pull them out because the Iranians tell us to. All right. Well, we always appreciate your insights and your perspective. Retired Admiral James DeVritis, thank you so much for joining us. You bet, Chris. Coming up next, the question of the day on Capitol Hill, deal or no deal? We'll tell you where things stand. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We want to head to Capitol Hill now, where those bipartisan Senate negotiations to address the crisis at the southern border appear to have resulted in a final deal, potentially, because Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer went to the Senate floor this afternoon to tell members that they'll soon be able to read it for themselves, along with the broader national security legislation it's part of. Listen. I want members to be aware that we plan to post the full text of the National Security Supplemental as early as tomorrow, no later than Sunday. That will give members plenty of time to read the bill before voting on it. But even if the bill passes the Senate, it faces a roadblock in the House where Republicans are loudly opposing it as former President Trump hopes to make immigration a key 2024 issue. Meanwhile, the House overwhelmingly passed a tax package that includes an expansion of the child tax credit. But that bill's path in the Senate also remains uncertain, in part due to presidential politics. In some very frank comments to reporters, Republican Chuck Grassley said, quote, passing a tax bill that makes the president look good, mailing out checks before the election means he could be reelected and then we won't extend the 2017 tax cuts. The bill includes tax credits, not checks, but Grassley's comments reflect a recurring theme of how electoral politics complicates policymaking, especially in an election year. Joining me now from Capitol Hill is NBC's Ryan Nobles. Ryan, good to see you. Thanks for being here. So let's talk about what we just heard from Chuck Schumer. He says that uh, there could be legislative text as early as tomorrow, as late as Sunday. As someone who has a Sunday show, we hope it comes out before <laughs> Sunday. Um, but what are your expectations here? What are you hearing? Yeah, it would be terrific uh, because I know you have a, a lot planned for this weekend for you to be able to get people to react in real time to that legislation by Sunday morning. Uh, you do get the sense that they are very close to getting something over the finish line. Uh, the negotiators uh, have been working on this pretty diligently for the past three weeks, and they're in a place now where basically all the big hurdles have been crossed, and they're now ready to put something else, uh, to put something out for the rest of their colleagues to digest. And, you know, when we say that there's a deal on Capitol Hill, that's always with an asterisk. Right, because once a deal is hatched with the negotiators, it then has to go out to the broader uh, membership to get, allow them the chance to weigh in. Uh, and that's part of what Senator Schumer was talking about today. He wants to give a couple of days for lawmakers to take a look at this before they actually begin the process of voting sometime midweek. Uh, but there is optimism that this will be enough to get the 60 votes in the Senate. The broader question then becomes, Kristen, as you rightly point out, is this something the House will even take up? Uh, it's important to point out that while Speaker Johnson has been very critical of what he's heard about the legislation, he has not looped in on the specificity of what is actually going to be in this text yet. So he's left himself some wiggle room that once this bill comes out, that is, it is perhaps something he could support. So there is still a lot that needs to be done here, but there is a chance that this could eventually become law in the near future. It, it, which would just be remarkable, given how intractable the issue of migration and the border has historically been. 
let's just take a step back and remind folks that part of the broader goal here is to tie this to funding for aid to Israel and aid to Ukraine. Ryan, where does that piece of this stand? Is it possible we could see a process where they split it up into two or maybe even three bills? I think it is possible, uh, Kristen, and it, it really depends on what happens with the border piece. Uh, it, for weeks, they've been telling us this is all or nothing, and just basically yesterday, we started to see lawmakers open the door to the idea that if they can't come to an agreement on the border package, then there needs to be a separate conversation about funding uh, to Ukraine and Israel. Um, and I think that's because there is a, a real reality here that while Congress has been fighting over immigration for decades. The situation with, uh, in Ukraine has a very direct and real uh, short-term necessity uh, in which it needs to be addressed. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to make it any easier. Part of the reason they packaged all these things together, Kristen, was because they wanted to use the leverage uh, to draw in conservatives that cared about immigration but maybe were nervous about Ukraine uh, and connect them with those who are really concerned about Ukraine but were maybe nervous about a tough border package. Uh, so you're not going to have that leverage anymore if you separate these pieces out. So it doesn't make it any easier to separate them, but to answer your question, they're at least open to that should this supplemental that's all together fall apart. All right. Well, uh, it certainly is complicated. Thank you for helping us understand it. Ryan Nobles, we appreciate it. We know it's going to be a busy few days for you. As you tease, we have a big Sunday coming up. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson will be my exclusive guest this Sunday on Meet the Press. Do not miss it. A lot to discuss with him. And just ahead, Mind the Gap, another new poll shows Nikki Haley way behind Donald Trump as Haley insists she's in the race through Super Tuesday. Even if she loses her home state, you are watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We have more from the first in our series of deciders focus groups. Women voters from Pennsylvania who supported Donald Trump in 2020 and opposed the overturning of Roe versus Wade. The moderator asked them what it means to be a Trump supporter and a feminist. Take a listen to what they said. Tell me what it means to be a Trump voting feminist. And Susan, you're a contradiction. Why, why is it a contradiction? Um, because uh, as we've all seen, Trump doesn't necessarily treat women as equals. Well, that is sort of like an oxymoron, but I look at his generation and in business back in the 60s, 70s and 80s was so different. And nowadays, you know, it's turned around, you know, the Me Too movement and everything else. And I'm hoping that He's adjusting to really how to treat women. He does have his good parts. He does have his own strong part. So I will put those ahead of my feminist beliefs. Joining me now on set is Akela Gardner, White House reporter for Bloomberg News, former Florida Democratic Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, and former Pennsylvania Republican Congressman Charlie Dent. Thank you all for being here. Kayla, I want to start with you. Obviously, the margins are so important when you are talking about the suburbs of Philadelphia, which is where these voters are located. What do you make of what we heard? I think this is just evidence that you know, abortion is not always a single issue for voters, both for Democrats mm -hmm. and for Republicans. And I do think that these voters can exist in the Trump coalition, partly because he's admitted that abortion has been a weakness for Democrats. He's acknowledged that the midterms, not all of his candidates that he endorsed did well. And so I do think there's some room here for some of these voters in his coalition. Mm. Well, it, it, that is going to be, I think, the question. Can Biden, Charlie, win over any of these voters? This discussion suggests they can. Akela's right. Abortion, or this discussion about abortion shows that these are not single issue voters. But what were your takeaways? You obviously know Pennsylvania very well. Well, uh, these were Trump voters yeah. that they were talking to. So I'm not surprised that many of them said they would not change their votes. But uh, the, the real problem is going to be on the abortion issue for Republicans is these are these swing voters, you know, who aren't wedded to either candidate. Uh, who will be impacted uh, mm. by this? Who will who will be affected? I was the last Republican in the House who voted not to defund Planned Parenthood, and I voted against a 20-week abortion ban. And so I can tell you this is a real vulnerability for Republicans. I get it. Trump was always never seen as an ideological doctrinaire candidate. Uh, and so I think some of his voters will give him some slack. 
But the problem is going to be with those swing and independent voters. Stephanie, what do you make of this and the fact that abortion, as Charlie is saying, has been seen as a vulnerability for Republicans. Democrats feel as though it's something that can help energize their voters, swing voters, independent voters, moderate voters. Does anything that you heard in that panel change your thinking? You know, I actually think Democrats have taken the um, moments when abortion has been on the ballot mm -hmm. by itself, and those wins there, they've gotten the wrong message from it. In those, vote, those elections, people were able to vote for, say, a Republican candidate, and then vote their perspective on abortion. And they took that to mean that that if abortion is uh, tied to a candidate, the votes will be the same. And I don't think that that's true. Mm. And you see a little bit of, he of it here where people can rationalize their support for Trump. Um, his base is incredible at doing that. So your message is don't over-index on that's correct. this issue. Um, I want to play something that these voters said about Nikki Haley, which is also revealing as we're about three weeks out from the South Carolina primary. Who would take Nikki Haley over President Biden if they were running against each other in November and Trump were not part of the picture at that point? Who would take Nikki Haley over President Biden? Just three of you. So by a show of fingers, who would take Nikki Haley over President Biden if they were running against each other in November and Trump was not in the race? Who would take Haley over Biden, assuming Trump's not in the picture? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I got well, seven of you. So everybody, but so Daisy, not you, but everybody else. Stephanie, it's so interesting because the polls show Nikki Haley does really well against President Biden. But these women in this focus group were a, a little less enthusiastic, I think. Yeah, I, I think that was expect. hilarious. That one was, yeah, like, she, oh, I guess. Was great. <laughs> and I think that's going to be the challenge for Nikki is that she just doesn't have the enthusiasm where we know that Trump's voters are incredibly enthusiastic, mm -hmm. incredibly loyal to him. And we've seen it in the primary races to date. It's been hard for her to overcome that. Mm, yeah, it, 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 it's notable because she has really stepped up her rhetoric, Charlie, and yet we got this new round of polling today, including this national poll, which shows Trump leading Haley 70 percent to 19 percent. That comes on the heels of the poll that we got out of South Carolina, which shows Trump leading by nearly 30 points. And Charlie, what's notable is Nikki Haley has really intensified her rhetoric, her attacks against former President Trump. And the big question, I think, for everyone, is this strategy going to work? Well, she's intensified those attacks b belatedly. I'm glad she's mm -hmm. doing it. Uh, but I think there's a problem that Donald Trump has that we don't talk enough about. There, he is, has some real base erosion. Yes, he's, he's clobbering Nikki Haley in, the, in that poll. But I, I, I think there's going to be a significant number of Republicans, maybe as many as 20 percent, who will not vote for him in a general election. And the problem among independents for Donald Trump is even worse. We're not talking about that enough. And that's why when Nikki Haley makes the electability argument, I think that resonates with a lot of people mm. because you see these polls showing that she performs much better head to head against Joe Biden than does Donald Trump. Absolutely. But Trump has a very low ceiling. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Akela, what do you make of that? I think what's really interesting about the clip that you just played, those were obviously all women voters. And obviously Nikki Haley is the only yeah. woman left standing <laughs> in this race. But that has not been able to energize Republican voters the way that it has for mm. maybe like a Hillary Clinton. But what's been really interesting about Nikki Haley is she continues to bring in donations. She fund she had more fundraising than Trump in the fourth quarter. But it seems that Wall Street continues to back her. Billionaires continue to back her. But she has not been able to grasp the electorate that Trump has. And that's ultimately what you need to win an election. And yeah. you notice that she's making a case that he is spending 50 cents on the dollar for every donation that he gets paying off his own legal legal um, <laughs> bills as opposed to putting that to a general election. Whereas for her, she doesn't have that overhang. No, that's right. And she says she's in this. She told me last week she just needs to do better than she did in New Hampshire. We'll see if she can do that. Let's talk about President Biden. Akela, let's look at the latest polling that we have in a Biden-Trump matchup. Trump beating him in this latest poll, 49 to 45 percent. That has already set off alarm bells, we know, inside the Democratic Party. We have President Biden out in Michigan today. 
talking about the economy there. There were protesters there. He's facing a lot of headwinds. He is. We've seen back-to-back -back polls now showing Biden trailing Trump. And I think the issue here is he's been weak among core coalitions. That could be black mm. voters. That could be young voters, Arab Americans. That Obviously, he's in Michigan today where there's a large population of the Muslim community there that had really been almost telling voters are telling telling the press essentially that they will not support Biden because of his stance on the Israel Hamas war. So he has these really core weaknesses with some of these groups that really helped him win in 2020 and he needs them to come out again for him. Stephanie, I think that Akela hits the nail on the head of why Democrats are so concerned because of these core groups who seem to be turning their backs. Yeah, so while uh, Trump's base is solid and behind him, Biden's base is fragmenting in large pieces. And the fact that he is being protested essentially by his base, mm. he's trying to talk about the economy and they were shouting him down. And if this continues, how is he going to be able to campaign and get his message out when his own people are creating chaos at his events? Charlie, does he have enough time to come back? We're less than a year out. Yeah, he does. But, you know, look, a lot of people who voted for Joe Biden voted for him because they dislike Donald Trump. That's that's the harsh reality. Trump's voters are, are much more motivated for him. Like I said, though, as I said a few moments ago, Biden's big hope here is that, uh, you know, these independents uh, and these soft Republicans come his way. That's what he's banking on. Now, he's also got another pr problem. They both have a problem. There are going to be a lot of people who are voting for neither. Nearly two-thirds mm. of voters don't want either of these guys. They think one's too old, one's too crazy, and this poll shows that crazy's beating old yeah. today. <laughs> but the, but that's, that's true. But a lot of them aren't going to vote for either candidate, yeah. and you're going to see a, an enormous number of people voting for someone other than these two. Yeah, that's why we're watching so closely to see if there's a third-party candidate. Great conversation. Thank you so much, Akela Gardner, Stephanie Murphy, Charlie Dent. Thank you for being here. Still ahead this hour, a Georgia election trial. No, the other one. We are live in Atlanta for closing arguments in the case over the state's voting machine systems. We'll explain. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Turning now to Georgia, we're closing arguments in a years-long legal battle over election machines just wrapped up with a judge set to rule in a civil case that could potentially have major repercussions for the upcoming election cycle. In a lawsuit initially brought by an advocacy group in 2017, the plaintiffs argued that Dominion voting machines used in Georgia are vulnerable to hacking and errors and that their use could violate voters' constitutional rights. State election officials have doubled down that the system is safe and secure and have testified overhauling the system in an election year would be, quote, nightmarish. Georgia's presidential primary is slated for March 12th. Joining me now to discuss this from Atlanta is NBC's Jane Tim. Jane, thanks so much for joining me. So you've been following what's happening inside the courtroom as closing arguments for the case take place today. What can you tell us? Kristen, this case is Dominion's, these controversial voting machines in Georgia, their biggest test yet. And we should say there's no actual allegations or proof of, of real fraud in this case for the most part. But it's about whether or not the risk of fraud is so profound that they are vulnerable, so vulnerable that they violate constitutional rights of the voters here. Now, the state says in the real world, these hacks that you're talking about, these vulnerabilities, they just aren't a risk or they're a managed risk. They say that the kind of things that we've seen in this trial, which included someone uh, hacking a machine with just a, a big pen uh, just wouldn't happen in real life. They say this machine is secure. But this judge, she tossed the last voting system here in Georgia back in 2019. And if she does it again or even casts doubt on this system in a contentious election year, uh, it's going to cast doubt on Georgia's election system overall. It's going to make voters feel less secure because a federal judge has come out and said these machines are real hackable. Mm. If she does well, good job talking over those sirens, Jane. We have about a minute left. Let me ask you, uh, just to put this into big picture, this actually dates, predates, I should say, the 2020 election. Why is this case so important? You know, this case is historic, not just because it got another election system tossed out, one that election experts pretty broadly agreed was completely unauditable. 
Uh, but because Georgia's elections, so go the elections here, so go the rest of the country. If a federal judge tosses these machines, they will be used to cast doubt on other election machines all around the country. Uh, and as you said, this lawsuit predates Trump and his allies turning on the election machines, claiming they were hacked and there were all these flipped votes. But you know, the ruling is going to happen in a, an environment where Trump allies are using it to make hay, no matter what she says. Yeah, well, we appreciate your being there and breaking it all down for us. We know you'll continue to watch it closely. Jane Tim, thank you so much for your great reporting. NBC News Now coverage continues with my friend Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.